Hello, everybody, and welcome to Encounters USA. This is a really special day for us because we have Rich Germo. And if you don't know who Rich Germo is, you do not have a lot of knowledge about Bigfoot encounters because one of the most legendary, one of the most documented encounters happened right behind us on Harstein Island. And we were so lucky to get Rich to sit down with us and talk a little bit about his encounter. So the first thing that we want to talk about, uh, Rich, is first of all, welcome to Encounters USA. Thanks. Well, it's great to be here, and it's really an honor. And uh, we're coming. We know that you're coming from a law enforcement background, and we're going to talk about that. But first of all, before we talk about your encounters, tell us a little bit about where you grew up, how you thought of things like Bigfoot and aliens, and what was the attitude of your parents towards this stuff. Uh, I grew up in Washington, and I lived up in Alaska most of the time. Mostly lived in western Washington, though. Um, I didn't really give Big for Aliens that much thought. Uh, I used to watch Unsolved Mysteries, and I kind of always thought that it would be interesting if uh, that type of thing were real. But I wasn't sure. Aliens, I thought, were more likely, probably. But I always wanted Bigfoot to be real when I was a kid. My parents, I don't think they cared one way or the other, to be honest with you. It wasn't a big deal. Uh, there was a Bigfoot story that uh, my parents had talked about before. I remember hearing about it, but I don't know the specific details of it. But uh, they may have been inter- interested in the topic as well. So, but the, you didn't hear any skepticism, because I imagine you grew up at a time when Bigfoot, you know, was in the media and stuff, but your parents weren't negative towards the topic, were they? No, actually there wasn't really. Bigfoot was never in the media very much. I mean, the only thing about Bigfoot that you ever heard was, you know, if there was an Unsolved Mysteries or, or some type of episode like that where they showed the Patterson-Gimlin footage, and then everybody had seen that. Uh, but, you know, I grew up in the um, 80s mostly, so... You know, and I went to high school. I graduated from high school in 1995, so I mean, it hadn't been something that had gotten to any serious level of interest like it is now. Okay, and yeah, now it's just huge. All right, so Rich, let's just get right into this. Uh, tell us about your encounter. Now, your first encounter with a Bigfoot was not here. It was actually over on the west coast of Washington State, in a town called La Push. And I understand that people who follow Twilight know where the town of LaPush is. So tell us about your first encounter with Bigfoot in LaPush. Uh, I was a LaPush police officer. I was on my way home, or my, on my way into work um, in LaPush. I was working uh, swing shift that day, and uh, it was about 7 p.m. I was coming into work. We worked weird hours sometimes. Actually, that would have been a modified swing shift graveyard. Anyways... I'm coming down the hill onto the reservation and uh, just passing the second beach trailhead where you park. And I had already passed housing units. And down by Lonesome Creek store, actually right at Lonesome Creek, it stepped out off uh, one side of the road and took like four steps, hit a fence line, and was gone in the brush. I was about 50 to 70 yards from it when it did it, so it was really clear what it was. I had uh, was taken completely off guard. It was kind of a big shock because uh, I'm a trained observer, and um, that was my job. And I happen to see this thing that doesn't fit into any known box, and I know what it is, but I'm not supposed to have seen it. And so, you know, I had sat in there for a short period of time just trying to gather myself because it was kind of a traumatic event just to actually witness it. But, you know, you felt secure and safe in the car and it disappeared. But it didn't even look at me. It just, I had a profile view of it the whole way. Right. And so, Rich, I know you've told this story dozens, if not maybe hundreds of times. And I really appreciate you sitting down here with us to talk about this because we really want to talk about some of the details of this encounter. So when that thing stepped out onto the road, I, it, it crossed the road, correct? Mm-hmm. And so the first time you saw it, did you know what it was from, from the very beginning? Um, I would say yes, in, in a way, just because of the mere fact you can see what's in front of your face. But it's not supposed to be real and you're not prepared to see it so it's like it's a moment where it's hard to explain it's just a really a 
something that just smacks you upside the head where you're you know what it is but you're trying to classify it as something that's known to you and comfortable but it keeps getting thrown back to where no it's this well it can't be that but no it's this because that's visually what it is i mean beyond any doubt you know so so yeah i mean it's really hard to explain the impact of an event like that because it, 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 it it's something that's like a bomb that goes off and it's life altering when you're not you know i had no idea you know that anything like this was real you know and then after i had seen it immediately after i would say pretty soon after the shock wore off i thought to myself where i really felt like i had been betrayed in a lot of ways because i wanted to know why I wasn't told about this because I obviously wasn't the first person to see it. I wasn't the first professional to probably see it. So how come I'm having to endure the shock, you know, that I shouldn't be having to endure, you know, as a public agent, a public official. And, um, you know, after that, I didn't really uh, get involved in the topic. When somebody would talk about it, I might, and I was likely to come in and say, yeah, I had seen one and describe it. But uh, I didn't just go around telling people about it generally. And people would laugh a little bit here and there. But, but okay, so immediately, um, let's just go through the encounter very quickly. I just want to see your thought processes because you see this thing and you have enough background knowledge to know this is not something that I have in my data bank. But this, you, you know about Bigfoot, right? So, Well, I mean, yeah, I knew about Bigfoot in the sense that I'd seen it on Unsolved Mysteries, and it was an interesting fairy tale. And even there had been a report down south on the Ho River uh, a week or two prior to that, at that time, called the Gene Sampson Incident. And I had remembered hearing about it, and I think I even read it in the paper or saw it on the news, because it was a pretty big deal. And I thought that was pretty cool. And then it just so happens that I see one a couple of weeks later, north of there, 10 miles. Okay, so let's talk about... Yeah, well, there's the Gene Sampson incident, and you knew about the Gene Sampson incident prior to this? Yeah, it happened like 10 days or two weeks before. Okay, so was it something like, hey, there it is? Uh, no, I mean, I in the back, afterwards that, that happened, I thought, well, maybe it was the same, maybe it was related, but there's a good chance it wasn't related, too, totally separate. Okay, we're outside here. This is no green screen behind us, so you've got actually authentic logging trucks passing by that's that's no sound effect there so the next thing that we want to talk about is you knew what you saw and so you talked a little bit about um you reported this so i would like to know how many people in the lapush community did you tell about this well you know when i came back immediately got the office and people saw that i was kind of something had happened by the look on my face, my skin color, I don't know. But they asked me what had happened, what was wrong. And I told them I just saw a Bigfoot. So they kind of chuckled at me and we talked for a little longer. You know, and actually the deputy that was there, he, in a joking way, I didn't know, I thought it was serious and I was willing to participate. He told me that I needed to write a memo because of the other incident that had happened, you know, that they, the county was going to be keeping information on it, which it was bullshit anyways. But um, I went along with it just because whatever, you know, I figured... I'm gonna, I document it, so I wrote him a memo we took back with him. I have no idea whatever happened to that. And I put a log in on our, in our CAD system, too, but who knows where uh, any of that is. I mean, that could all change by now. Um, and the people in the community obviously knew because when something like that happens, everybody finds out about it. And, you know, I even got really killed by little Indian kids, you know, asked me if I saw it, had seen the UFO with three Bigfoots get out a couple of weeks later, you know, and they laughed at me. But... Um, yeah, everybody knew about it. Well, that kind of leads into my next question is, was there a difference between how you this story was received by the, I, I want to say the white community versus the native community in La Push? No, it was the same. All the same? They both messed with me. It didn't matter. It, you know, if they heard about it, they'd joke with me about it. I mean, and poke at me. And, and nobody came forward and said, well, we have a legend of of these no i did have creatures. like uh, the fish and wildlife officer showed me pictures he found a bigfoot tracks that were out in the dicky on investigation so people did come and confide in me and, and tell me some stuff and i had a couple of people come and tell me about their own encounters that they had you know up north of there on the beach and 
and different things and what people had seen, you know, and, and some other stuff. So, yeah, but, I mean, they joked it with you and poked at you at the, in, on the service, but then people would come and confide in you and say, yeah, I had a similar thing or whatever like that. So I have to ask you, was there a lot of, was there a lot of people that came forward? No, I think there were two or three. Okay. Yeah, because I've, I've said this a lot of times and probably ad nauseum, but I grew up on the peninsula myself and never heard anything about Bigfoot, so this was always a surprise to me and kind of why I'm actually down here talking to you today. All right, so um, you saw Bigfoot in real life, so before that you had probably no interest in it. How did that sighting affect your life? Well, I mean, I had to consider immediately, you know, I spent a lot of time, I guess go to, I, my lifestyle was that I spent a lot of time in the woods, most time by myself. I fished a lot at that time, and that's mostly all I did in my free time. I lived in Forks, and um, I fished almost every day, and I spent a lot of time in remote areas alone, you know, where it could be dangerous just doing anything. But uh, what it really made me consider is the fact that how vulnerable I was in those situations based on what I had seen. Because I had to have, I saw this giant humanoid, you know, that was in the 8-foot range, probably 800 to 1,000 pounds. That obviously, it's, if it's living undetected uh, and invading all these people with our technology, even back at that time, that it's got to be highly intelligent. And with its size and agility and the way it moved. You know, even though it didn't run, you could tell how smooth it was on its feet and stuff. That, and just how large, in particular, and muscular it appeared to be, and just its vast size. That, that, with its intelligence kind combined by its physical tools, you are in a position of complete vulnerability when you're in their environment. And I knew this immediately upon seeing it, thinking about it in a tactical mindset. And that if it wanted to do something to you, it wouldn't regret, it wouldn't matter how well armed you were or trained or anything that this thing could make you disappear and put lights out on you at any moment that it wanted to by just thinking about what it does and making the right move at the right time. And so essentially I had to consider the fact and come to the realization that I was essentially defenseless in the woods where there's this alpha possible predator that's out there that is way, in some aspects, way advanced past me. As you know, way stronger, probably way faster, and much smarter in its environment. And so it really made me change the way that I did stuff, and I and I quit, you know, venturing out on my own so much, and, and most of the time if I went fishing and stuff, I did it with somebody, or I went close to my car, I didn't go far off at that time. And it took me like four or five years before I, I relaxed more on that, and I started doing more stuff again. Um, just because it was a pretty impactful event in that aspect where it made me rethink a lot of things related to, you know, the possible risks that could be out there. And I, and I didn't have anything to base any risks on, but it also made me think that, well, you know, I saw this thing, it's real, I was a police officer. If somebody thinks that I don't have a right to know about this, there must be reasons why that are significant, you know, and, uh, and those reasons must outweigh the risk of telling the public at least that's what I thought and so I thought that potentially there was some danger out there and it wasn't until later that I actually became involved in research about eight years in fact okay so I just want to ask you on a personal level um, you're, you're a person before you see Bigfoot are you a different person after you see Bigfoot uh, I say no but it does start to change you in certain ways. At least it did me. I, many people, it doesn't. It started me question a lot of stuff and not trust a lot of things just on the mere fact that this is a major thing and this information's being suppressed or withheld for whatever reason. And I wouldn't ever think, based on my experience as a police officer, knowing what technology the public even knows that we have at this point and what we've had in the past, the fact that I was in the military too, and just the way that I think, I would know that if... They're undocumented humanoids that are out there roaming in North America. The United States government would consider that a threat to national security because they're outside the control of the United States government. They don't have any control. They don't know what they're doing. You know, and so the United States government would utilize every resource possible to find out as much information possible about that. Right. Because it's directly under their umbrella and a direct threat to them. Yeah. Right. And I know that logically that's what has occurred. Mm -hmm. There's no question in my mind that that's not what's been done. And, and whatever they have found out, they have decided to not acknowledge anything. 
and to not disclose anything right. related to the Bigfoot topic, even much far less than UFOs or aliens, even though these things are living right behind our fences in our communities. Right. right? And they decide to not tell us anything about it, which tells me that they're either very afraid of it and they don't think there's any sense in telling us because we have no control over it. Or I don't know what the other reason could be. Yeah. You know, uh, um, I really don't because in the other aspect of it, potentially, you know, which I don't think that it, it probably is a big factor because these things are probably highly adaptive and they've learned to live right close to us. And many of these things live right next to people and close to residential areas. And um, I don't think that we have the ability to impact them in any way or, or any serious threat to them because they can adapt so quickly to food or whatever they want to do or d different areas. We're not really. They're when one step. They're, they're ten steps ahead of us at all times. How, right. how do you think they could stay hidden in today's environment? Right. You know. And so we're not a threat to them. But but it, so it's not for that purpose that they keep it a secret. You know. So I don't know. Right. Well, we are going to talk um, about uh, all of those topics about because first of all they do present if and we're going to talk about the David Pilatus four hundred one one mystery about two or three videos down, but these creatures. Um, obviously present some kind of threat just by the nature of their size and and the one that you saw did you we didn't talk about how big was that thing how tall was it I think it's, uh, I would say it was in the 8 foot tall range there, there was a fence that was close by and stuff and I would say between 800 and 1000 pounds probably man and so that Sim you know, yeah similar it, size to the one that I saw here okay and so that that has got to be terrifying and so I want to ask you, when you started talking about Bigfoot, was there a change in the way other people treated you? Uh, I don't know, to be honest with you. I don't really consider that. I'm not really that concerned with what other people think of me or how they treat me that much. So if they did, I mean, uh, I wouldn't have cared less anyway, so I don't think I really even paid attention to it. Okay. Because, you know, it's just the same thing with mm -hmm. people that you know, experience a UFO or Bigfoot or a Dogman. And that's what we're talking about here, Rich, is, is we're, on Encounters USA, we're of the belief that these things are all related. And that's why you're so important to us, is because you kind of share that same opinion, and you have a lot of evidence to back up. Um, and we're going to be talking about that as we continue these interviews. But right now, the last question I'm going to ask you is we're sitting right across from Harstein Island, which is behind us, and we're going to cross over there, and we're going to look at Rich's Bigfoot encounter that happened there. But before we do it, how tell us, how did you get here to Harstein Island? Today? Not, not today. <laughs> what brought you here looking for Bigfoot? Okay, uh, I had just started out, and my old partner, we started the Olympic Project together, Derek Randall's. Uh, was doing a, a BFRO investigation on the island from a house that's right across the street from this area where they had reported some encounters. So I reluctantly came with them out here a couple of times, and it was an ongoing thing that, that manifested into something else completely, you know, where uh, our benefactor had leased the house. You know, we put somebody in the house and put surveillance on it, and everything quit. But during the time that we were researching it together, we found impressions, heard vocalizations, and recovered some hair. And there were a couple of sightings by the original reporters that lived in the house. Uh, and then um, that that's how initially we got started, so I'll save the rest for later. Yeah, is this the hair that you gave to no, Melba? No, uh, Henner Fehrenbach got the hair from this site. Okay, okay. All right, so yeah, we'll talk about that later. Um, all right, well, the next thing we need to do is um, I think we're going to head on over to uh, Harstein Island, and from there we're going to continue on.